Hi, my name is Anna Van Balen. I'm an independent podcast producer and consultant and the host of the podcast, Every Day is a Food Day. Hey, podcast besties. Welcome back to the show dedicated to making your podcast the best it can be. I'm Courtney Kosak, your BFF in helping you grow and monetize your show. And today for episode number five, we are doing something totally different That is right. I got to keep switching it up. Keep you guys guessing. (laughs) Our guest, Anna Van Valen, has had a truly unique career trajectory from actor to 20th century Fox recruit, where she schemed her way into developing executive producing and hosting their first ever podcast. That's a pretty awesome claim to fame. These days, as an indie podcaster herself and a podcast consultant, Anna is an advocate for cross-media collaborations, which is a different way to go about the whole promo swap strategy. So Anna's going to share how she got started, some really great case studies to get your wheels turning, and her tips for how you can pitch brands. But of course, we have to start with Anna's podcasting origin story. Uh, So my background is actually as an actor, writer, director. That's what Hmm. I did for many, many, many years. I trained at NYU and RADA. I got my master's of fine arts at Brown. And that's what I was doing for a long time. Plus, you know, living that life where you're waking up and going to your survival job at a media company right. and then Ugh. at lunchtime getting in a cab and going across <laughs> town so you can audition for a commercial and then leaving work and going to like perform Shakespeare off Broadway uh, and then getting up the next day and doing it again. And I just had a moment one day where I was like, I'm going to die. <laughs> like, this is how I die. They're going to find my body on the one train like <laughs> like in a yard. So I decided I wanted to move to Los Angeles, take a break from that rat race and really find a way to combine my creative background and then also learning about the industry. Uh, and I actually got recruited by 20th Century Fox Film Company. Oh, nice. To do what? Yeah. So I, I actually chose to go into the strategy and business development department because uh, oh. I wanted to learn more about the industry, which was just like... A lot of guys in blue button downs named Nick. (laughs) That was pretty much what I was working with. Um, But I started working on some fan engagement projects for our franchise films. So uh, not directly on the films, but things like a Predator app or a mini series for Alien. Or Uh I did some Comic-Con activations for Planet of the Apes. And then this idea of doing podcasts to celebrate our films was like floating around. And in my brain, I was like, this is perfect. (laughs) This is totally a way that I can do my creative thing, write, direct, you know, host, perform, but also have it be, you know, a business endeavor. Uh And I totally waited. I never mentioned that I should be the one to make it. I just waited um, (laughs) until we got there. And they were like, who's going to host it? Anna, were you an actor? And I was like, me? (laughs) Oh, my gosh, you guys. I hadn't even thought about that. (laughs) I guess I could try it. Smart. (laughs) And so I I developed, I executive produced and hosted the first ever podcast from 20th Century Fox, which was called Screen Dive, where we celebrated our beloved catalog films like Devil Wears Prada and The Sandlot and Young Frankenstein. I got to interview Mel Brooks, which I will never miss an opportunity to work that into a conversation. (laughs) And then grand plans for a bigger department and network, but unfortunately Disney bought the studio and shut it down. So yeah, I'm over it. So how long were you there? About four and a half years. Okay. But you got to cut your teeth in podcasting while you were there. Yeah, I got to cut my teeth. I got my first taste of it. And it really was a combination of all the things that I was passionate about. I loved the low barrier to entry. I felt like it was something Mm -hmm. that you could do from 20th Century Fox to like, yeah, chicken or living room. Literally. Mm-hmm. Um, like us right now. Yeah. Look right. at us. And here we are. <laughs> and I, so I started to do consulting with like entertainment companies who wanted to pivot into podcasting. Oh. And then COVID hit and that dried up real fast. But what I could do was produce. So I built my home studio. I decided to produce my own stuff. And just like I wanted to learn about the industry to be more well-rounded on that side, I was like, I should learn how to edit. I should learn how to record. I should learn how to put this together so that I have that 360 view of making a show. And so I've been doing that and then helping other people do that as well. So tell us about your show that it's going right now, right? We just finished our third season. Yes. So it's called Every Day is a Food Day. 
And it's about the stories, scandals, history, and holidays behind your favorite foods. So every episode, we pick a favorite food or beverage, and we just nerd out on it. And we look at the history of it, um, significant stories, wacky stories behind it, you know, food culture, food crimes, a lot of food crimes, people. Really? A ton of food crimes. And it's just great fun. We love talking about hidden figures, the women and BIPOC people who contributed to our commerce, our recipes, our culture in ways that have not been acknowledged. Um, And it has been a great opportunity for me to learn about marketing and promotion and get really creative and scrappy doing it independently. So I'm excited to talk to you about one particular way that we've done that. Yes. First, I want to get, you know, so you launched this show Mm -hmm. in the pandemic, right? Yeah. And what were your big like growth milestones with the show? And maybe these go in tandem with what we're about to talk about. I think that once we got into it, once we got like six or 10 episodes in, I felt like there was starting to be some sort of word of mouth and we got into the groove. And then after we did our first season, about like 10 episodes, we took a hiatus, which I really recommend to people because it gives you a chance to slow down, not just be trying to keep up with your production schedule, look back at what you've been doing, pull your audience and see what worked and see what you can do more. And that really gave us a moment to regroup, think about how we wanted to plan the next season and do some partnerships, do some bonus episodes, like really play with that. And then when we went into our second season, there was a big jump there. We really hit our stride with our format, with our process, and then also had really discovered these colors of different ways we could reach out to other podcasters, reach out to other, you know, places and companies and just sort of elevate it and give the audience more, just like more stuff that they would love. And so that was a big one was starting our our second season. Um, having a few great guests on the show and just the quality of, you know, it was interesting. I listened to the season one, like finale or later episode. And we were like, hey guys, so we're going to talk about popcorn. Um, We hope you like it. (laughs) And then in the second season, we're like, what up? It's French Friday. You know, just that confidence. Yeah. You find your, your voice. Yeah. Yeah. As season one sponsor of this very podcast, Mopod has already helped Podcast Bestie reach number one on the Apple Podcast How To chart. Woo! That's right. We did it, besties. We are moving on up. We are moving up the charts, and I want to keep moving up the charts. And if you are feeling the same way about your podcast, Mopod is an effective, targeted way to promote your show. And you don't have to take my word for it. It's already trusted by industry giants like Condé Nast, iHeartMedia, and the HubSpot Podcast Network. And that's because it works. But Mopod isn't just for the big guys. Mopod Boost is perfect for indie podcasters like us. It's actually been my favorite paid advertising experiment to date. You know that if you are a paid bestie subscriber and you can try it for just a hundred dollars. Plus, if you're a bestie, you get 10% off with the link in the description. And if you don't use that referral link, I am going to be so mad at you because you get 10% off y'all. You work hard on your podcast. You invest a lot of time. I know you do. And it's worth it to invest some money to help your audience find you. I firmly believe that. I'd rather release fewer episodes and spend a little extra time and money on the promotion. So give it a try for yourself. Let me know what you think. Make sure you use that link in the description. (laughs) Tell us about, you know, you guys have done some really effective cross promotions, it looks like. So I want to hear all about your strategy with this and like some good case studies. So yeah, today I want to talk a bit about cross media promotional partnerships. So I know there's a lot out there about podcast promo swaps, which I think are great. You know, you you promote somebody else's podcast, they promote yours. You know that the person who are the people who are hearing this are podcast listeners. Mm -hmm. So you've got that in But my thought is that podcast listeners are three-dimensional people, and they have lots of interests. They use lots of media, lots of different products, and it can be just as effective to partner with those brands or those companies to introduce your listeners to something new that they'll love and also expand your reach to the users, readers, you know, customers of your partner 
as well. So you can really tap into that three-dimensionality and find a whole world of opportunities to cross-promote. And some of the reasons I love doing this, the like cross-media, non-audio partnerships, is one, it's non-competitive. Like there is, as much as you want to support other podcasters, people do have limited ear time. You know, and so there is a little bit of a risk that if somebody has limited ear time, they're going to try out this other podcast and be like, mm, I listen to this now. <laughs> there is that little risk. It generates a ton of reusable content for both sides. We're all lost in the content quagmire, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a new campaign to have ideas about content assets to create. You can build your network beyond just the podcast community, which can make all kinds of connections and resources for you. And another thing is you get to support other creators. You know, you're not just getting a boost, you're giving a boost. So if it's another creator that you believe in, that your values are aligned, that's a big draw too. Explain that one, like an example. Like if there's, I don't know, we wanted to support other female creators. Mm -hmm. So we specifically partnered with the one that gave me the idea for this whole thing, who was a woman I used to work with who was building an app. Right. Or another female uh, business owner who had a subscription box company. So other female creators, we wanted to lift them up as well. Small businesses, we wanted to lift them up as well. And especially people who we felt like their mission was in line with ours. OK, so, yeah, because this is a little bit out of the box versus how people normally conceptualize mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So, like, what was your first foray into this and like, how did you get the idea and how did it go down? So the first one was a partnership with the Mana recipe app. So this is an app created by my great friend, uh, Rachel Abadie, and it is like Tinder for recipes. <laughs> People put up recipes, they put up recipes, you swipe left or right, you create your own cookbook, uh, you put up pictures when you've made the recipes, like it's social cooking, right? We hadn't talked in a few years. We used to work together, hadn't talked for a few years. And I saw her posting about this on LinkedIn and other places. So I just reached out to her and was like, hey, we're both in the food space. Let's connect. We chatted and we're like, oh, let's, these are very different things, but let's figure out some way that we can collaborate. Uh -huh. And then in that hiatus I talked about, we did an audience survey. And one of the questions that we asked was, when do you like to listen to the podcast in terms of like, what are you doing? And the most common response is they listened while they cooked. Uh. And two thirds of our respondents said they consider themselves home chefs. So we were like, mm. people listen while they cook. Let's give them something to cook. Yes. So I reached back out to Rachel and I was like, what if we made recipe tie-ins for the episodes? So we would make our episode. We'd find some recipe that was fun that had to do with the food we were talking about, post it in the app, her app, mm -hmm. and then promote that, create a bunch of social media, you know, a bunch of assets and cross promote that. So we called it Cook the Podcast. And then we did things like we did an episode called As American as Apple Pie <laughs> and uh, did a recipe for apple pie turnovers. We did one about salad called Let Me See That Tong. <laughs> and so we did a smashed cucumber uh, salad. We did one about takeout. So we made dumplings. And it was just really, really fun. You know, it was a creative thing. And then we had people you know, send us pictures if they made the food while they were listening to the episode. And, you know, we dropped the episode and then dropped the recipe the same day. And we both saw a little bump. Oh, really? You know, we both yeah. saw a little bump. And you heard back from people or not? Nah? Yeah, we heard back from some people that they made the recipe and it was super fun. Great. So that was one that, again, we got to support their app. They supported us. We reached a whole new audience. And also, I liked that one because it was digital forward, right? It's an app. Uh-huh. So if people are already using that kind of app, if they're already kind of first adopters, they're probably listening to podcasts mm -hmm. or at least more able to navigate, you know, how to find the podcast app on their phone <laughs> and listen to it. So that was one of the first ones that we did. And that really got me thinking, what else is there? There's blogs, there's consumer products, there's like events, there's other websites, there's digital brands, influencer accounts, there's all kinds of things that we could partner with and Give our audience something cool, something new. So, okay, where'd you take it from, from there? I would love to hear a, a couple more case studies if you got them. Yeah. So another one that we did was a giveaway. Because mm -hmm. uh, just like these tie-ins, you know, you can do like profiles and write-ups. You can do digital downloads. You can do product bundles, like 
all kinds of stuff that you can do once you open it up past audio. So we found another company called Pantry Party. And similar with the, with the cooking idea, she had a monthly subscription box that was like pantry items to make your food better. So it was like umami and sauces and spices mm-hmm. and little gadgets and things like that. So we created a giveaway with the point of capturing emails. So it was like a raffle. So if people wanted to enter the giveaway, they dropped their email, which opted into both of our email lists, and they were got an entry for this giveaway. And it was just like, she didn't have to do anything extra. It was like the box that she was sending out, or it was a seasonal box she was sending out. We also put some food day swag in there, and we raffled it off. We created assets that we cross-promoted in all our channels, and we ran that for, I don't know, a month, and then we did that giveaway. And then we had the winner send us pictures of her cooking with the stuff and listening to the show, and, you know, it was just another way to enhance an experience that we knew was important to our listeners. And how many emails did you get? Oh, I don't remember, but it was like... Like worth it? It was like, it was worth it. It was like dozens. Okay. Dozens and dozens of emails. That's a good one. Yeah. So another one that was really fun was we did an episode on honey. If you want to hear about food crimes, honey crimes are rampant. International <sighs> scandals, beehive theft, it's a whole thing. You got to oh, listen God. to the honey episode. <sighs> but we touched on mead, and I'd done a bunch of research because I'm a nerd, and I came across this meadery in Flagstaff, Arizona that had their own podcast called the Drinking Horn Mead Cast. And I thought theirs was the best. Like, I listened to all these podcasts from, like, National Geographic and, like, these, uh-huh. you know, real outlets. But, like, these dudes in Flagstaff <laughs> drinking <laughs> meat out of a stein. Like, theirs was absolutely the best. So I reached out to them and said, you know, I loved your show. just want to let you know we gave you a shout out, you know, indie podcaster to indie podcaster. If you ever want to collaborate, I felt like their show had a similar vibe to ours. And uh-huh. they wrote back, like, in seconds. <laughs> 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 and we're like, yes, let's do it. So what we decided to do was a crossover episode. Uh So we did a crossover episode where we were all talking about mead. They were talking about their story, why they love mead. And we did our thing, our shtick of like cool stories. I did like mead and mythology, right? Uh Except, of course, our model, we did this with a wine episode, a margaritas episode, is obviously you need to be drinking the beverage for research, for authenticity, right? Of course. So the guys shipped me and my co-host Leah each a box of mead. Oh, fun. And then as we were drinking it, we were talking about each different flavor Uh and, you know, getting a little tipsy, having fun. (laughs) And then shared their link and, um, you know, they promoted us on on all of their stuff. They had a pretty big following in, you know, the mead community. (laughs) And we put a link to their store. And the next day after our episode dropped, their website crashed. (gasps) What? Because so many people who'd heard the podcast went on their website to buy mead. Like their store crashed. That's amazing. And so we started getting DMs being like, hey, I meant to buy their mead, but it says their website's down. Oh, my God. So I wrote to the guys and I was like, is there a problem with your website? Should we tell people to hold off? And they were like, you did it. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, that's a lot of traffic. (laughs) Isn't that cool? Yes. So did you both see bumps? Or were you about the same size or no? We're a little bigger. So we saw a little bit of a bump, but they've they're just been really supportive and like kept shouting it out. And um, so I think overall that episode had a higher shelf life um, in terms of like post launch uh, Mm -hmm. numbers than some of our other episodes. And again, it was just like really fun and great to connect and great to get their product out there and really great for them to introduce us to if somebody's going to follow a mead a meadery they're obviously interested in food culture and right things like that okay so identifying these good brands to work with yeah like how do you do this how can besties replicate this so there are a few things that you want to think about before you go into reaching out to people one is that the partnership the promotion it's got to have some kind of clear benefit for your listeners and for their audience. So maybe it solves a problem or it enriches or enhances an experience like or an activity like the cooking. You know, it's got to be relevant to your uh, subject matter and your audience's demographics and their interests. You want it to be pretty balanced between the two audiences so it's effective for both of you. And again, you want it to align with your values. Um, so it should really be something that will introduce both sides to something they love. And 
a great way to find that out is to learn about your audience, ask them questions, get some feedback, learn about them, right? So listener surveys, like a Google form, Google form goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Um, Listener survey, social media polls are a great way to ask, you know, what's your favorite episode this season? When do you, do you listen to this while you work out, while you commute, like while you put your makeup on? All of those things are great information and super simple. Like, especially if it's like multiple choice, anybody will answer a multiple choice poll. And then looking at some some industry research, there's lots of cool, there's like the big Edison research, and then there's like lots of cool little niche research out there that'll give you some clues. And once you've got an idea of what you want to do, you want to think about who would be the, the right partner for that. And things you can do, like with the friend of mine I used to work with, is just pay attention to your network. What are people doing in LinkedIn? What are people doing on social media that you feel like there is a tie, maybe an audience overlap, and is a person or a brand that you might want to work with? Um, fundraising platforms are a really great place to look. Oh. Because if you're a smaller podcast, another company that is smaller or fledgling or trying to get up off the ground, they're a great place to look because they're also looking for these promotional opportunities that they probably don't have a huge marketing budget, you know, but they want to be creative in how that they get the word out there. Mm-hmm. So I like fundraising platforms, social media, slide into DMs, and then go back to those audience survey answers. If you asked what products do you use and a whole bunch of people said they love this, they all go to the container store. I don't know. I made that up. Um, if they all love one kind of brand of something, that might be a brand to reach out to. So, you know, I get a lot of pitches um, Mm -hmm. and I get a lot of bad pitches. And I think the worst thing is starting with introducing yourself before. It's like you need to make a really clear value proposition about what the person's going to get out of it first and foremost. What are your recommendations for how to pitch these people once you're ready? Sure. Well, the first one is like, actually want that company. Don't send out some like blanket, boilerplate, random emails. Everyone sees through it. I see through it. You see through it. Mm -hmm. You know, you really want to have a reason why you want them, a reason why you want to work with them and the reason why they should want to work with you, right? Actually research them, try out their products, listen or read to what they make, right? And express that authentic interest. Also come to them with some kind of plan. Don't just be like, hey, you want to collaborate? And then crickets, right? Come to them with a plan. Overall, make it easy for them. So if you show up and you have a plan, it's just for them to say yes, right? Uh You got to be flexible, though. It might need to change. So it fits you both. But Uh have something thought out. Don't forget to drop that it's content creation. Like I said, we're all in this content creation quagmire and all continually trying to come up with ideas for posts and All of that. So if this is going to have content creation built in, it's Uh going to give you ideas for assets that you can use over and over and over again. That is a great selling point. And then do the heavy lifting, right? If you're pitching someone else, make it easy for them in the sense that you're going to do the majority of the work. They're not going to do nothing. Uh But if you go to them and they're like, you're like, okay, so you're going to have to develop six more features for your app, or you're going to have to product (laughs) test all these things and develop, they're not going to do it, right? Right. But if you're like, here's my idea, most of it is on us, you can help us implement it. Like when we did the giveaway, we handled the shipping, you know, we handled putting it together, like just those kinds of simple things for the recipe app, we came up with the recipe, just those kinds of things that aren't like a huge burden, but that you're communicating to them that like, hey, this has more benefit for you than it does work and time, you know, and that kind of investment. Hey, besties, you have been awesome about helping me rack up some ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, and the offer still stands. If you give me a five-star rating and review over there, I will give you a shout-out on the podcast. All you have to do is send me a screenshot or include your name and the name of your show within the review. But I actually have another ask for you this week. Okay, we got to keep it fresh. And obviously, a ton of people listen to podcasts on Spotify. So I need a presence on Spotify. I need to signal to other Spotify listeners that this is a good podcast. All you're going to do is if you're listening on Spotify, you go to the upper left-hand corner of the podcast bestie page, you click the star button, and then you click all five stars, and then you take a screenshot and you send it to me. And you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to give you a five-star rating and review back, baby. I mean, that is a one-for-one deal. 
And I just want to bring to your attention that that podcast advertising space on this podcast is a steal. Okay. It's for sale on my website, podcastbestie.com slash advertise. There is a classified option and there is a presenting sponsor option. They are honestly both an incredible value because you actually get the podcast, which is now reaching upwards of episode number four, got 3,500 people and it is not even been a week. Okay. That's pretty good numbers. You're going to reach all those people, podcast enthusiasts, podcast industry people. These ads start at $30 for classifieds. And again, you get access to the podcast and you get over 3000 readers of the newsletter as well. You get ads on both plus social media. It's honestly a no brainer. I can't believe more people haven't taken advantage of it. So I am being a little birdie right now. And I'm telling you, If you are trying to promote something, and I'm talking to you, big podcast, too. I mean, shoot, this is a steal over here. (laughs) Take advantage of me. Buy a $30 ad, and you are going to reach over 6,000 people. I mean, what? So, again, podcastbestie.com slash advertise. It's so easy to advertise on this podcast. It's so affordable. So stock up while you can, okay? Oh, I was going to ask you about you make Instagram reels and I'm curious, have you seen any big bumps? Like what are your tips about that? Instagram reels. So my reels are mostly for my own business as a podcast coach and consultant. I haven't seen that crossover into my podcast because that's not really what they focus on. But I'm curious about, you know, I never post reels and I got like 20,000 views on this real that I'm like, right. what? I don't even understand. Have you seen that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. my The most views I've ever gotten on a reel was a reel of a tree. <laughs> okay. It was a tree. <laughs> I went to Sequoia National Park and I took this video like going up the biggest tree in the world, General Sherman, and put like the, you know, Space Odyssey music behind it. And it's got like 3 million views. Oh, my God. Not the ones I spent hours and hours like scripting and filming and editing, but the tree that one's got millions of views. So there's like no rhyme or reason to it. <laughs> so do you think this is a an area that podcasters, you know, say they're not super into the video component? Do you think this is an area that they should be focusing on in 2023? I think that if you can build it into what you're already doing and not make it a whole ordeal, because if you try to make it a whole additional ordeal on top of producing your show, you're just not going to do it. And then you're going to feel bad about falling behind. So if you tape remotely, you tape over Zoom, make sure you record that. And there's ways to frame it up so that it gets in that nice, you know, square over square. So that's super easy to pop into a reel. You can go into Canva and make a background template that you then pop that into. What I always did was I had my my Canva template, I popped in the Zoom video, and then I put it into Headliner and put my captions on it. Super easy, maybe took an extra hour, but I wasn't adding on a ton of work to my podcast production. I do think that's the way that a lot of people consume their social media. Obviously, the algorithms, we think. We think that's what the algorithms promote. So you want to stack the cards in your favor, right? By doing what the algorithm wants, we guess. But I would say if you are an indie podcaster, you're probably doing everything. Yeah. So if you decide that you're, it's going to be a whole different thing and you're going to film different things and edit it, and all, you're not going to, and then you're just going to feel bad about it. Yeah. Has it been worth it podcast-wise for you to do these reels? Like with Um, the Canva template and stuff? Yeah, it's simple enough. It's great. I'm a big proponent of those content pillars. So for every episode you drop, you say, okay, I'm going to do three posts. The first one is a preview. The second one is a videogram of us taping it as a tease. And the third one is some cool images that talk about, give some background on what we talk about in the episode. So we made those videos one of those buckets. And those definitely got play. You know, people see your face, they see you talking, and they definitely have a response to it. Okay, awesome. So I am asking everyone who comes on season one of this show to audit me. So you probably are most familiar with Podcast Bestie. I also have a podcast called Private Parts Unknown. It's about love and sexuality around the world. And I have a podcast called Bleeders. It's about book writing and publishing, but 
you're here on Podcast Bestie right now. So I'm just asking every guest if there's something you think I should try or if you think there's something I should stop (laughs) doing immediately. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I don't think I'm in a position to tell you how to run your life. No, just, just tips. Maybe there could be a fun way to integrate video Mm. uh, into something you're already doing. So like you could make part of this interview on Instagram Live or something like that. Mm. Or you could have like if we tape this now and it drops in a month, the day that it drops, we do a half hour Instagram Live or a few days later when people have had a chance to listen to it and we answer people's questions. And then, you know, that's automatically something that we can both put on our social. And I like doing that as well because it's a little more interactive. People can ask you in real time because it's not as edited. Like you definitely want something more polished for a podcast, but that might be something to try. Oh yeah. And I love that feeding the content, you know, beast that we all have to feed. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much to Anna for sharing such great information. This was a very expansive way to think about how to collab. I love it. And thank you for tuning into this podcast, Bestie. In last week's episode, producer Megan Hayward gave us the scoop on how Edit Audio and Ad Large grew Mina AF to over 100,000 downloads in just a couple months. It is a must-listen episode. And in fact, all of the guests so far have been just incredibly generous with information information and insights. And I got a tweet that freaking made my day. It's from Ashley Hammer Pritchard. She's the managing editor at Descript and has a podcast called Taboo Science. I sent out a tweet celebrating the podcast chart success and Ashley said, congrats, so well deserved. I have finished every episode feeling fired up to try something you talked about. High five. High five indeed. That tweet made my day and no pressure, but I would absolutely love it if you tweeted at me or screenshotted listening to this episode right now or took a selfie and posted about it on social media to help spread the word. I will 1000% repost and it is so fun getting to know my besties better and getting to be in community with you guys. So check out my other podcast, Private Parts Unknown, which is about love and sexuality around the world and The Bleeders about book writing and publishing for more of my audio creations. And if you want to take your own audio creations to the next level, I am teaching a one day podcasting intensive all about how to grow and monetize your show. It's through Pandemic University. And this is going to be a three hour deep dive into the business side of podcasting. This will help you if you're trying to launch a new show or season, just grow your audience in general, monetize your show through a variety of different methods and take your skills pro if you're trying to break into the industry. So it's coming up on Saturday, May 13th. It will be recorded if you can't attend and you still want that information. It is super affordable. Plus, there's an option where you can get feedback and a one-on-one meeting with me. So if you want my feedback on your podcast or your marketing plan or whatever, make sure to check out the link in the description to get more information and sign up. I hope to see you there. And you can follow me between episodes at Courtney Kosak. That is K-O-C-A-K on Instagram and Twitter. And of course, this podcast started out as a newsletter. So I send out a ton of newsletter exclusives to my besties as well. I have been really focused on the podcast lately, but I have two in the can that are ready to roll. So make sure you are signed up for Podcast Bestie on Substack. That's podcastbestie.substack.com slash welcome. There is obviously a link in the description. And until next time, happy podcasting. Bye, Bestie. Bye.